The Koi Gig Pod on OTB in association with Cadbury, official snack partner of the Republic of Ireland women's national team. Top pocket goal! It's what dreams are made of. They are going to the World Cup Finals! Hello and welcome to the latest episode of the Koi Gig podcast. And you haven't heard from us in a little while, so we are very excited to get back into your ears and discuss some football because that is what we are here to talk about. To do that, I am joined by the one and only Captain Karen Duggan. Uh, two of us are running on limited hours sleep. I think I have about four behind me. So <laughs> if we say anything slightly rambly at any stage during the podcast, please do not judge us. Karen, last night, 3 0 loss in Tala to France. Uh, so it's positives from the game atmosphere was one of the best I've seen it in Tala pretty much a full stadium new record first 40 odd minutes we played the sort of attacking football that we wanted this team to play for a long time and then sadly it all unraveled what's your like overarching feeling this morning after watching the game last night admittedly on very limited sleep <laughs> um yeah no, I was trying to be really positive last night when I was looking at it um but I think it's a bit of a reality check as well um as to what we could be potentially facing into in the world cup um I mean France took a long time to find their feet we played really really well for the first 44 minutes and then it looked like when France wanted to turn the screw that they were able to take it up a notch I think a concern that we've had probably for a long time now is what happens if we concede? How do we stay in a game? How do we go at another team? And I think that that is still very evident. I know it knocked the stuffing out of us having conceded two goals right before half time. Um, obviously, that's the worst time to concede. That's like the oldest cliche in the book, but it, it really is. But then the second half, you kind of would say, go out, reset, try and approach the second half the way you did the first. And we just couldn't get a foothold in the game. And I don't know what we can do to change it if we are in a situation where we do concede a goal and need to try to establish more possession. Mm. We kind of did it a little bit, I suppose, against Zambia, but also the parameters for that match were very different. The opposition was very different. I mean, the entire squad literally changed practically yeah. in half as well. Yeah, no, it was completely different against Zambia because he actually brought, were bringing on fresh legs. Beer is going to be more reluctant to to make changes. She she hasn't done it throughout the qualifiers. She's not going to start whipping people off at half time. She looks to be very settled on the way she wants to start these games. It looks to be the starting eleven that was there yesterday. Um, and even you could see that in the second half, Farley was tiring about 10 or 15 minutes before she actually got taken off. Um, and that wasn't, it didn't matter until Farley actually was the one who had to sit down. So there is a reluctance there to to change things when things aren't going disastrously. Um, so I, I just I don't know what our plan B is if our resilience and our you know the the defensive solidity that we're built on isn't quite there um and it was there for 44 minutes and it was really good and it allowed us to actually look at, at Lincoln in with Carusa and look at getting on the ball but once that goes what's next I think it's long been something we've worried about or talked about that once you go past that starting 11, A, that Vera doesn't make a massive amount of changes and doesn't have a massive amount of trust, but also in very key positions, there isn't the same sort of backup. Like it's slightly different if you're bringing on Amber Barrett in the attack, but if you're looking at changing around much in like the midfield or even the defence, things do kind of go a little bit pear-shaped at times. Looking at that first 44 minutes, just to kind of examine it a little bit more before we go into the not-so-good stuff, um, what was the main positive that you took away from it? The the line that we started our defence from. Obviously, France were are a massive opposition, and there's been occasions where we've played against people who have that golf and quality and we've started off much deeper. So it was really positive to see that our back line was starting much higher up the pitch and what 
we our centre backs allowed our our wing backs to be released and go and press their full backs, and it just means that our midfield isn't completely overloaded trying to do doggies out to the, the full backs wingers and their own job in centre mid. So I thought the shape um and where we applied the press was really really good in the first half, um. That's what we want to see more of. Obviously, it gets more difficult as the game goes on and tired legs and stuff like that. But if we could have started in that vein in the second half, I think um, even if the scoreline wasn't different, the, the performance might have felt a bit more positive. But we know that it's there now. Um, that's really positive. Uh, I guess another positive it was definitely Caruso's performance. Um, she went toe-to-toe with Wendy Renard, turned her a few times showed all the, the attributes that she's been put in the starting 11 for hold up play. Um, and I think really importantly, I think that's going to be massive for us is she won a few set pieces in advanced areas. And again, looking at yesterday in instances where we won't have a huge amount of possession, those set pieces are going to become really key. Um, they were the only time we really looked like we were going to get in the, the French box or, or threaten in any way. So that's going to be massive for us and her strength it kind of allows us to to work with that, which is really good. Uh, for when she scored her goal and it was ruled offside, I was sitting in the TV gantry in Tala and uh, there was like a line of us all doing different broadcasts at the time. And at that time I wasn't on air and this little seven-year-old behind me tapped me on the shoulder and she was like, that was an offside. You should like report <laughs> that. And I was like, you should be down there being the lines of because I think you would do a better job. If that hadn't been ruled offside at the time, do you think it would have changed our perspective on the game? Because even if those goals had been conceded later, it would have put a slightly different spin on things. Yeah, because I think the big concern we have is where goals are going to come from. And particularly when Katie went off the pitch, you're kind of like, oh, well, from open pay- play, it doesn't really look likely now. Um, obviously, we haven't seen... Carissa hasn't been given enough an opportunity in Ireland jersey to prove that she she is a goal scoring centre forward. What we know now from what we've seen is that she's really good at hold up play. She's got a really good engine. Her press is really good, um, and she can bring other players into the game. But we don't have proof that she's you know a goal scorer. Um, it would have been good for her confidence. It would have been good for everyone. We also need to not get too excited about it. Um, I mean it was good play, but also the the goalkeeper played to the whistle and her position was all off. I don't think she was trying to save it. Um, so let's not get ahead of ourselves. I think that we were going one nil up against France. Um, but look, it was good. She showed good pace to get in behind um the French defence. I think they'll be looking at themselves a little bit the distance. They could drive a bus between the centre backs. Um a few buses actually I uh, wasn't overly impressed with with them in the first half. Um they looked a bit sluggish but yeah again just when Katie went off the pitch, again, mass kind of panic of where something's going to come from. And I mentioned it last night. Um, and I don't know if it's something that they've been told to not concede free kicks and things like that. But in the second half, you have to find a way to get yourself into the game and without sounding too Roy Keane about it. Go and, go and get involved in something. Go and give away a free in the opposition half. Just try and rattle the opposition because... At the end of the day, it looks like we're going to have to just really frustrate teams for a lot longer. And a way to do that is to get a bit, bit meaner, a bit nastier. Um, and we have that in our armory, but I didn't see any of that last night. Granted, it's a friendly, but without Katie throwing herself about, I think Denise was the only other person who really gave mm. a free away. Yeah, with Carissa, I think like when she was at HP Cod, she had something like it was 30 goals and 50 odd games. So if she could find some of that form for us, that would be great. Yeah, and I mean, yeah. we've been talking about her for a while being like, why don't we give this a shot? Because again, Heather was doing a thankless job of just chasing long balls when mm-hmm. she was up there. Um, we're looking to, to play more to feet now. Um, we should have been doing that for Heather anyway, but uh, we are doing that. But it, it's a pity that Kira doesn't have a little bit more uh international minutes under her belt because I feel like there were opportunities definitely there to to give her that the times particularly where Heather had maybe run about 13 kilometers in 60 minutes <laughs> but um but it's good that, talking can... about that never happened we were never yeah. looking at Heather's heat map and being like wow oh. she literally covered oh, she alive yeah <laughs> um and then 
what's the other one you were talking oh yeah the set pieces and stuff i pearl made this pearl slattery made this point on comms last night she was saying that all the goals that france have scored in the last couple of months have come from set pieces on the edge of the box or else corners so i do wonder if that was part of the stand back approach or also as well this is the other thing is like are players worried about getting injured as well if they go in too heavy to a tackle or like i know it's probably worse if you pull out because you're more likely to injure yourself than you know if you kind of go for it and then you go oh maybe not yeah i think there's an element of that i mean there's no way that in one of the world cup matches that katie would have gone off for a, a roll down color or whatever it was but obviously you have to take precautions at this point but you lose an element of your game if you're not willing to do that um, and you don't want those bad habits creeping in. Uh, mm. I think any time you play for Ireland, it, it never really felt like a friendly because I feel like you're always proving a point to you know, management, to whoever. Um, so I don't think that that should ever creep in. Obviously, these are extraordinary circumstances that we're not used to, you know, heading off to a World Cup. But I, I was disappointed to see that element of things and yet notwithstanding the fact that France have a really good conversion rate from set pieces but similarly we we love it when people just start lumping balls into the box against us I mean particularly against Scotland as soon as Scotland started doing that in that quali- the, the playoff game I knew we were going to win that game because we lead that up all day you know we've got three strong centre halves with the header we've got a confident goalkeeper now and we've got plenty of cover, cover coming back from midfield. So I would back us to defend from free kicks. I think the concession from the corner will be really disappointing. But again, it was probably Izzy's pair coming in from the edge of the box. And it's just a learning curve for her. Um, uh, France are a step above Anthony. She, she would have experienced in an Ireland jersey before. So um <laughs> although it was a baptism of fire in one way it was, it was nearly good that she has had that experience should she have to come on in the world cup and you know i think you have to realize that in that wing back position first and foremost your duties are and this irish team are going to be defensive mm. and you switch off for a minute and you're punished we saw it for the first goal and we saw it for the third goal unfortunately but again thankfully in a way it happened last night for that first goal, who does the fault lie with in your head? Because obviously it squirmed out from underneath Courtney. And it's kind of one of the few mistakes that we've seen her made, making that sort of contact. Yeah. You know, no, I wouldn't, I, wouldn't overly, I wouldn't overly blame Courtney. I, it was kind of just... It was a bit uh, of a family of errors. Yeah, it really was. Uh, that, that's the phrase I was looking for because... But firstly, we didn't get tight enough in midfield. Now, that's that happens in games, especially when you're you're being very cautious and you're kind of marking space and things like that. But again, I don't know how many times we've talk, talked about Kenza Daly on this podcast um, throughout the year in the WSL, but you get her space. Um, and then Lacar was, she was gone down the, the right-hand side. And just to go back, like, I think Izzy is more of a winger. So, you know, you get caught ball watching a bit and, and she got in on the blind side. So there's some fault that lies in midfield for not getting close enough to Dali. Of course, Izzy's positioning will be looked at. Um, that's a given. Uh, Heather's clearance was poor and I think the ball was maybe going wide and when it hit off Courtney's legs and squirmed in underneath her. Um, the most disappointing thing is we rarely let people get in behind us, penetrate our back line. So I think that getting caught with that crossfield ball to Lacroix in the first instance is the most disappointed part. Like people can do bad clearances, you know, a ball can squirm from underneath you um, when you attempt to save it. But we rarely get caught to, with ball watching or with our, our line above the ball. Um, so that would be looked at. But it was it was quite soon after Izzy had come on. And again, like biggest sellout crowd, forgetting that she's, not only turning 22 mm. in at the World Cup and stuff. So um, I'm sure the coaches will work with her on that. I, I wouldn't like to put a huge amount of blame at her door for it, just given her experience and, and given the coming on for Katie McCabe against France in front of a record audience. But again, these are big things you're going to have to face in the World Cup. 
and we need to make sure that everyone's headspace is in a right place that they can block these out and concentrate at the task at hand and it's kind of ill discipline for those two goals you know it was the first time our back line weren't completely in line with each other so Louise stepped to the ball our two centre halves were a little bit behind her for the second goal and we just allowed them to get turned and you can't do that and you can't give Le Samir a sniff at goal so again that'll be a similar with Sam Kerr so it's just little lessons learned but little lapses that will cost us when you come up against the best of the best mm. well I would rather have Izzy Atkinson come on in France or in Tala against France in a friendly before the World Cup and experience the sort of pressure that a team like that can put you under 100%. rather than do it in two weeks time against Australia or maybe a few days later against Canada because at least now there is I know you it is only two weeks, but there is still time to like mentally prepare and like physically know what is needed of you and at least bring yourself up another couple of steps, if not the whole way. Like I'm not expecting her to turn around and suddenly be a completely different player. But it's like when I was talking to her last week at the media day and about the impact of going to the WSL and how much she struggled for like the first while just getting acclimatized to it and how different the level of training expected of you was but I think we can definitely see even though she wasn't getting massive game time how that has improved her in the last year so hopefully experiences like last night only further that over the next like couple of weeks and months and years yeah and she's not the only one who will be examining their performance as well um I think there were instances again in the first half where a passing needed to be tightened up because when we did have a bit of momentum something like a short pass into your midfielder that leaves you open or vulnerable to a break, it, you know, it, it really kind of knocks you back a bit. So we can't really afford to be doing things like that. Um, I, uh, Megan Connolly is a really good centre-back, but I just think we miss something with her in midfield. I think it's the tackling. Mm. I think it's the freedom that she gives Denise um, and like uh, that was she didn't have put a foot wrong centre back don't get me wrong I mean she's really good there I just for Denise's sake prefer. <laughs> would prefer her in midfield and then I don't know what that does to the shake up do you push Rusha onto one of those more advanced positions because I actually thought she did quite well as well yesterday um, but then Vera Pau likes the balance of having Farley, who's kind of the ball retention player, and Shiva, who brings the engine in those pockets. Um, and I think that Caruso maybe mentioned that this is their only their like third time playing this system. Now, the formation looks the same, but as opposed to having wider players, we have pocket players and mm. with different personnel and stuff. Um, and it's kind of a unique position to be in that we had two players making their home debut as well last night. Of, not be many people who haven't picked a ball on home soil who are heading off to represent their country. So, um, I'm what else do you feel about that card? <laughs> oh, <laughs> I don't know how I feel about it to be honest. Um, but it is what it is at this point. I think we've gone around yeah. the houses enough in terms of debating broad selections and stuff like that. I think again when we needed to switch something up last night when Heather may be tired or we were looking at a wing back replacement AD Finn would have been a prime candidate to do that but here we are um, similarly if we wanted to change it and go long and look for something different maybe Leanne Kiernan could have but anyway we won't rehash that we are where we are um, but we are in a unique position and like you say it's only 10 days away but I think those 10 days are going to be really important for us in terms of really nailing down everything as a starting 11 um, and again just getting used to each other mm. and with the so the players we've kind of looked at some of them who maybe could have improved I thought like Heather Payne probably had one of her most absent not great games that we've seen from yeah. her in a long time and again admittedly the opposition was very very good but it was I'm not used to seeing her chasing her tail quite as much as she was especially in that first half yeah it looked like she was rushing things you know she was she was uh, too quick to nearly get rid of the ball and maybe it had something to do with the, the caliber of opposition but 
what I like about Heather Payne in the wing back position is that she's willing to to go at players and and take them on. Um, but too often she was trying to to pass it, and and some of those passes were going awry. Um, and also physically, uh, she was pushed off the ball more than what we'd like to see, you know. Um, which you know is it, maybe a bit of cause con for concern, not just in that position. I think at times we look, we do look slighter than a lot of teams. You know, we don't, we look like we can be pushed off the ball quite easily in some positions. But having said um, that, there was one point last night where Marissa Shiva, who's like five foot nothing push Wendy Renard off the ball and I was like that is the best thing I've seen we deserve like a goal or something yeah. just for that one yeah. moment <laughs> yeah it's the little thing she'll we'll take the small wins yeah um, yeah look Heather will know herself that that wasn't her best game um but again she's only probably getting back used to playing that wing back position she has played it before and, and I've no doubt that she'll do a really good job and it for us again um she gives us an option going, it's an option going forward, you know, she makes really positive runs when we are on the ball, when we're not on the ball and it's completely down to her defensive duties, she will she will need to dig out, but she has Niamh Fahey there beside her who will, you know, she'll guide her well, she's like basically an on-field coach when you play with Niamh, it makes your life so easy, she's so clever, but um, yeah, I think she, she looks like she could probably do it a, a day's rest or, or two you know obviously you have to factor in the fact that some of these girls were traveling from america as well um and they've got more travel to come so i think a lot of the work now needs to be done on on the tactic board as opposed to anywhere else no one's going to get any fitter between now and the world cup um so we may as well just nail down any little concerns that we have at the moment and tighten things up <laughs> I don't know. It's, it's I still have like this blind optimism that we can do really well at the World Cup, and but I also feel like yesterday was a little bit of a reality check of mm. what the standards are different. I mean, France are a step up from from Sweden or Finland. We have to remember we got a little bit lucky with our group. I don't think Sweden were at their best. I don't think Finland certainly weren't at their best. Um, not taken away from our massive achievement. It's been unbelievable, but. The, the Australia game would be very, very telling. Yeah, I was going to ask what your takeaway was from yesterday because as well, you also have to, as talented as this French group is, it's also just coming together after like years of, you know, strange Her, management. So French. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And like play, certain players are only just coming in. I mean, we didn't even get to see the likes of Amadine Henry, Henry yesterday. I think she's yeah. going to, uh, or should I say Amadine Henri? Henri. French out. Uh, I think she's going for an MRI scan today. So there's a possibility she might actually miss the World Cup with an injury. But it like, I mean. Ashamed after getting back in. Like I think a lot of yeah. people want to see her back in. Oh, it would be such a shame. But even, you know, you look at Eugenie Lissomer, like what an incredible player, 89 goals. Well above the French record. Anything, yeah. Renard, you have like even on the bench the sort of players like Selma Baca, who's like so so good. Diani, top yeah. scorer in the French league. They're like they're playing without the likes of Katodo as well. So I don't know. Maybe this World Cup is coming a little bit too soon for them. But I think if like Irene Renard sticks around and gives them a couple of years, they're hundred percent going to be massive contenders for at least yeah. the next if not beyond yeah when they switch it on they're, they're frightening some of their one touch play like it doesn't matter how fit or strong we are sometimes it's just teams are like that they, they bamboozle you yeah, I always think at the time that we played Spain at home and I was I was dizzy I was they just didn't give us a touch of the ball it was it was actually lousy like and it was a bit like that at, at times with the French yesterday so they have that in their armory I find it really hard to know what will happen at this World Cup because the French, obviously, like you said, they, they're only just coming together. They're getting players back and obviously missing a, a massive player in Kototo. But then all of the other kind of big contenders are as well. You know, there's key players missing from everyone, maybe bar Germany. Germany, again, yeah. they slip under the radar. I think they slipped under the radar in the Euros and without that injury to pop, I think it's a different story. 
Um, England obviously missing key players. I find it hard to know if they can contend. Mm. Where's your money going at the moment? People keep asking me this, and it's funny because every other major tournament, we obviously haven't been in it, so I've paid so much more attention to everyone, whereas yeah. I was so focused on like Nigeria, Canada, and Australia <laughs> that I'm like, who else is even playing? Is, are there other teams in this World Cup? Is it yeah. not just like our one group and that's it? Um, I don't know. I think I do think it's too early for France, but I think like I wouldn't be surprised if they got past the quarterfinal for the first time ever. I don't think you can ever rule out the US in big games, even though, especially big tournaments, especially considering the fact that, like, there's been so much talk about how Ananovsky isn't setting the team up right and that the players aren't really at it. And I feel like that's the sort of attitude the US want people to think about them going into a World Cup. I just, I would never, ever discount them from that. I don't think England are going to have it. I just think they kind of, I don't know, the atmosphere even around the camp seems very different and there's a very different pressure on them compared to last summer. Yeah. And then, like you say, Germany, I think, could do a bit of a run. So a couple of options up there. I don't think Australia will win it as much as they seem to think they could be on with it. I wouldn't be surprised if they went on a run, but I don't think they'll win the overall thing. Yeah, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's fine because we are going to have plenty of podcasts anyways throughout the tournament to keep you all up to date on what is happening. Uh, I'm flying out there on Sunday, so I will be reporting live. I'm not. <laughs> uh, yeah. If you saw the amount of packing and traveling I have to do over the time, I don't know how much of Australia so I'm actually going to see yeah. apart from the inside of the plane and the matches. So this is not the worst thing in the world, to be fair. Um, but yeah, we will be playing bringing you plenty of content during that time so do make sure that you are subscribed to us on wherever you get your podcast feeds and you can also get us on twitter with any of your questions and queries at the koi gig pod and the koi gig pod on otv is sponsored by cabri official snack partner to the republic of ireland women's national team now we did put a call out a week or so ago at uh, looking for ireland's best supporters and we had some really great entries and uh every so every couple of podcasts probably i think we're doing about two podcasts over the world cup per week so we'll probably pick one every couple of weeks but um, oh yeah we are we are picking our supporters in a half and this week we got an email in from Catherine keegan who wanted to nominate her football crazy little nine-year-old emily aka emzo so em has been to every Ireland women's home team match since she was three years old she lives and breathes the squad and they're a huge inspiration to her in her own little football career she's played football since she was four starting off with the lads then playing a year up with girls moving to her own age last year where she netted over 25 goals that's not too bad a return Karen and, up here. yeah 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 <laughs> and more than that in insists in a season where she her where Catherine coached her team and they went unbeaten the entire season in the top league for her age she also follows the Shamrock Rovers women's team which mm. we won't <laughs> on that, has been, and has been to every game of theirs with the exception of Sligo missing out Sligo's a great spot uh, since they started this season her main inspirations are Katie McCabe Denise Sullivan and Alana McAvoy who she absolutely adores she is a supporter and a half every photographer knows her by name and call her for photos at different games not only is she the loudest and the most passionate fan ever she makes signs and brings them to every game so thank you very much Catherine for submitting her as your supporter and a half sounds like she is more than worthy of the title and she's also our first inaugural one so pretty pretty good a little clap there from Captain Karen. Can't take it. I actually met her at the Shamrock Rovers game as well. So there you go. So not lying. So not lying. <laughs> Karen has the proof in the pudding. Um, if you would like to nominate someone as a supporter and a half, please do get them into us at the Koi Gig Pod at offtheball.com or else you can DM us on our Twitter at the Koi Gig Pod. Karen, thank you very much. I will see you very, very soon where we can uh, nervously and excitedly chat to each other and build up to that Australia game. But for now, I hope you managed to get a bit of a nap in at some stage today or at very least an early Friday off work. I hope you have a safe flight and I'm not jealous at all. <laughs> thank you very much. Thanks everyone for listening and we will chat to you soon. The Koi Gig Pod on OTB in association with Cadbury, official snack partner of the Republic of Ireland Women's National Team.